Um, Jason Rasmussen asks, why space? What is a good argument to sell space to today's society? Up until a couple years ago, not even that, maybe even about a year ago, I was kind of filled with despair on this issue because, you know, space is not an easy sell. It used to be, but what they were selling wasn't space. And this is something I'm very clear about with the Free Frontier, which we'll talk about in part two. The Apollo program wasn't selling space to people. You're selling pride to people. Now, in the 50s and 60s, you were, in fact, selling space. You were selling space because it was an exciting and new environment. It was a frontier. And that's why if you look at, like, a lot of these 50s uh, rocket, you know, rocket to the moon kind of thing and, uh, you know, uh, moon is our harsh mistress, these kind of things. If you look at kind of 50s, 60s sci-fi, the thing that's actually kind of charming about it once you get past how silly it is, is the, is the lingo. It literally, truly is. Hand me some, um, some, uh, get me the space wrench. Uh, we've got, uh, put it on the space visor. We've got, uh, how many space, uh, uh, rations do we have? Uh, Jump in Jupiter, great galaxies. Uh, you know, it's, it's just fascination with the environment. It's really awful, 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 awful dialogue, but it's kind of charming in its own way. The space this, the space that, the space this, the space that, best summed up, by the way, in one of my favorite, probably my favorite piece of animation, which is Space Madness, a uh, Red and Stippy episode. Space Madness. Uh, so, yeah, space, 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 space. But the Apollo program was about pride. It was about achievement and pride. It was about the flag, is what, is what the NASA glory days were about. It was about the flag. It wasn't about the environment. It was about the flag. It was about seeing the flag on the moon. It was about seeing guys... And Jim and I rendezvousing and, and, you know, and going places we hadn't gone before. Uh, I guess to some degree the purists thought the moon was cool, but, you know, the moon is kind of boring. Not that I wouldn't want to go, but if you really are just a regular average Joe, if you look out at Yosemite or something, it's like, holy cow, you know, incredible stuff and birds and trees. And look, there's a bear. Here's rivers. There's fish in the rivers. And, and there's, you know, I can hear buzzing of insects. And the sky is blue, but not all the time. At nighttime, it's different. And then the moon comes up and, you know, but. The moon is, you know, the moon is gray powder and a black sky. That's pretty much it. Um, so it's not even the environment. The Apollo program was about pride. And I had thought, now that we'd done that, uh, that there's not much to sell about space. As I said earlier uh, at the beginning, even our imagination of what space looks like is is not true. Space is not filled with nebulae. And, and these incredible colorful clouds of gas and dust that you can see if you just get out of the atmosphere, if you just get closer to it. No, it's just gray. It's, it's just a gray smudge. The other thing I'll say before I get to the answer, because I do have a positive answer about this, Jason. Uh, I'm a guy who spent 40 years uh, uh, trying to, still trying to get into space and, and thought the whole idea of space colonization and stuff was awesome. If you'd asked me when I was 20, 25, 30 even, 40 even, probably even 50 almost. This has been, this is how recent it is. Would I be willing to go and live on Mars or on the moon forever? Would I be willing to go on a 20-year tour of the solar system? I would have said, yes, of course. Even if you don't come back? Even if you have to live in, in space forever? Absolutely. Live in space? Are you kidding? Living in space is what I was built for, baby. I'll live in space for the rest of my life. Sign me up. Get me out there. Most people who are space freaks feel that way. But as I get older, uh, I realize that I definitely want to travel in space, but I do not want to live in space. And nobody does. Nobody does. Remember earlier we were talking about, um, I, keep, this, I think it's the only episode where I've said remember. I've said it twice now. Of course you remember, you smart people. We were talking a, a while ago about specific impulse and mass fraction. And that means that the lighter you can make things, the, the, the easier it is to get there the less fuel or reaction mass you have to carry. So keep the weight down. The way you keep the weight down is make things small. So here's an aesthetic that's built into Aurora. And this is how you're going to know that you got a real kind of a realistic feel. When I talk to people, people said, do you have any idea about the art design for the inside of the ship? I said, I do. What, what does the inside of the ship feel like? Not just look like, what does it feel like? The inside of the Aurora feels like a restroom on an airliner. That's what it feels like. 
and you'll know you've got it right if if you capture the sense of being in an airline or restroom lavatory, I guess. Inside the lavatory, now you know you're talking. If you get the sense that that the kitchen feels like the galley in the back of a 737 and that the the quarters and the certainly the bathroom and everything else feels like an airline lavatory, you're there. You cannot afford to bring big structures with you. These giant, huge structures, you just can't. You can put them into orbit because you've got a big, heavy rocket. You don't have to go very far. You're not talking about efficiency. you got a Saturn V to put Skylab up there and 100 shuttle launches to get those things up there. But you're talking about going someplace and slowing down, getting back. You have to keep it light, which means carbon fiber, and you have to keep it small because airway stuff, the bigger the the bigger the volume, the more the airways. Well, you say, well, what, what difference does it make? Well, air weighs stuff. Air has weight to it. And the more air you have, the more fuel you need to push that air. And then the more fuel you need to slow that air down at the other end. And the more fuel you need to carry and push the fuel that's going to slow it down, and the more fuel you need to push the fuel that's going to push the fuel. So it never ends. So in order for it to work, it has to be small. I remember being heartbroken as a kid. In, in, in the actual Apollo days, because it looked like by the time I was 12, 13, 14, it looked like I was going to be at least six foot six one. Uh, I wasn't that tall yet, but I was headed there. And I remember people saying, you can't be an astronaut if you're over five foot nine or 10 or whatever. They're really remarkably small guys, these Apollo guys. Buzz Aldrin's, somebody going to tell me in a second how tall he is. I don't think he's much more than five nine. He looks like he's about five nine to me. These are smaller guys. They had to be small. They had plenty of tall guys. They just couldn't use them. So, Somebody just said, what about inflatable habitats, uh, hyper-ion team? Inflatable habitats are great. We'll talk about them next time. Inflatables are great, but you're still talking about moving stuff, and the more stuff you have to move, volume is weight. You've got to build the, the pressure shell, and you've got to build all of the uh, electrical components and the water components, everything you build into that thing and the stuff you put in it, because if you're going to build it big, it's because you put stuff in it. No. Why, why, you, have to, you have to get out of that idea. And you have to ask yourself the opposite question. Not why can't we make it bigger. You have to ask yourself, why is an airline lavatory so small? That's the question, right? Nobody likes it. I don't know how big people get in there, frankly. I'm a pretty slim guy, and I have a hard time. I'm six foot one. I have a hard time getting into an, air, in, into an airplane lavatory. So you have to ask yourself, if it's so uncomfortable and so miserable, why is it so small when in the economic interest of the airline and the comfort of the passengers, it'd be so much better if it were two, three times that size? Why is it so small? Well, part of the reason is if you made it bigger, it'd be taking up payload. And you payload is not as important. I mean, comfort's not as important. It's small because if it were much bigger, it would take up seats. But it can't be a whole lot bigger because you're not flying to use the lavatory. You're flying to get from point A to point B. So it's small and cramped because an airplane is limited by its diameter, and that has to be relatively small. And so think about this. Really what I'm trying to say is this, folks. I've done enough traveling as a result of this amazing life I have so that I am bloody tired of it. Uh, a five-hour flight from L.A. to, because I live in L.A., so there, I don't get the, going to the East Coast is as long as, it, it's, a, it's a long flight. So, you know, I've done five-hour flights more times than I can count. Three-hour flights are hard. Five-hour flights are really brutal. And I've done Australia and Thailand. Those are 12 and 14 and 18 hours. That's actually slightly different. You get into a whole different headspace there. But I've done an 18-hour flight. So basically what you're basically asking somebody if they want to live in space is the question is, would you be willing to live on a 737 for the rest of your life? Because that's about the total area you're going to have, really. And I'm not. I'm not. I'm, I'm willing to live on a 737 for a couple years, and I'd live on a 737 for a couple years if, if it was worth it. And, but when I'm done, I want to come back and I want to live in Montana or um, Wyoming. I want to come back and have fresh air and green and mountain lakes and birds. And uh, I'm not a horse guy, but if it's good enough for James T. Kirk, it's good enough for Bill Whittle. I want to come home and have a life. And that's how I think we have to think about things because I think that's going to be the reality of the social dynamics of it. Would I do two years on, on um, series, cracking water? 
for fuel? Yes, I would. I could do two years in a spam can. I absolutely could do two years. I could probably do three or four years. I could certainly do it when I was 25, 30, 55 now. I'd do a couple years. Uh, would I go to the moon in in a can for, would I live in a 737 for three weeks to go to the moon? <laughs> Are you kidding me? Of course I would. But I wouldn't want to live in a 737 for the rest of my life. I don't think most people would either. So when we talk about colonizing space, I think we're really talking about, I really think the attitude of flight crews in space will be very similar to the attitude of engineers who have to go to Saudi Arabia. I know a few guys who've gone to work in Saudi Arabia. And they, to me, it's the, the dynamic is exactly the same. You're going to Saudi Arabia? Yep. How long are you going to be there? I guess a military tour is more or less the same thing too, but uh, I'm going to be there for nine months. Really? Yep. Looking forward to it? No, I am not. Why not? Well, it's 190 degrees in the shade. You can't drink. You can't gamble. You can't have any fun. You don't do anything. Well, why are you going? I'm going to go for a limited amount of time, and I'm going to make seven times what I make here, and then I'm going to come back with my money, and I'm going to make a life for myself. I'm going to endure it. I'm going to endure the hardship. Oil rigs, same exact thing. That's a, actually probably, you know, I never thought of it before, but I bet you an oil rig is probably the perfect example of what space flight will be psychologically like. There are lots and lots of people who work on oil rigs, and they're, and living on an oil rig is not unbearable. Um, in fact, over a limited amount of time, it seems like it could be kind of fun in the same way that a sea cruise might be fun for a while. But living on an oil rig is something you can tolerate for a while. But I guarantee you there's nobody on this earth who got on an oil rig at age 25 and determined they were going to live on the rig for the rest of their life. Maybe there are, but there are not many. I just don't believe it. I think you go on an oil rig and you endure the hardships of it and the adventure and all that other stuff. You make a ton of money and you retire to someplace nice. I think that's pretty much the way it's going to go. Um, I really think the way it's going to go. So, um, yeah, as somebody pointed out, uh, Guata uh, who was it? Yeah, uh, Guatemalan water snake, uh, second rank uh, Vasily Borodin. Uh, he wants to have seen Montana. It was the guy who died in uh, in um, uh, Hunt for Red October. Sam Neill character. He wa he he's ready to uh, defect to the United States. He's a submariner. He lives in a spam can under the ocean for four or five months at a time, but he's doing it so he can retire in Montana. I really think that's the way it is. I don't want to live on a 747 or a 737 for the rest of my life. I'll do years because I have a high motivation to see some of these things and experience them, but I won't live there forever. And I think most people feel that way. Um, so anyway, the argument was, how do you sell space to people? I think, I think in terms of the free frontier, which we'll talk about in part two, you have to understand if you're going to go to the American people, you're not selling them space. You're selling them pride. That's what you're selling. You have to, I think you have to be crystal, crystal, crystal clear about this, Jason. You're not selling them space. Space is actually a fairly boring environment. It's pretty uniform. Living in orbit would be cool. Being in orbit on the space station would be cool for about a week. And after that, I don't think I'd like it that much. And I think probably it'd be like Vegas. My first day in Vegas, woo, second day in Vegas, like, eh, I've seen it before. Third day, I will crawl over broken glass to get out of Vegas. Orbit would be amazing, and I'd sit there by the window, and I get the feeling I'd just be be lifelong dream for me. But after a week or two, certainly after a month or two, be like, are we are we going to see anything different? We going anywhere? No, we're going to stay here. I'm ready to go home now. Um, so I don't think you can sell them space. I don't think you can sell them the environment. I think you're selling pride. I think you're selling national pride. And what that really comes down to is. You can be proud about a lot of things in America, but I understand my people. I understand why Americans, half Americans or some number of Americans, loved the space program, thought that Apollo was the essence of America and that it was a high point of human civilization. Because when we talk about Apollo, we are talking about pride. A lot of people said it was a pride to beat the Soviets. There's no question beating the Soviets was a big part of that mix, but I don't feel like when I think of Apollo... I. When I think of Apollo, I don't even think of the Soviets. I think of the Soviets as being just another bunch of people watching us land on the moon. I don't think like, oh, we beat the Soviets. It's like, no, we did something much more important than that. Apollo, Apollo was the living example of what we could do if we put our mind to it. That's why my favorite, I think my favorite line in all of motion pictures ever 
is in uh, Apollo 13 with, uh, it's not my, my friend Gary Sinise's line, but it's in Apollo 13 with my friend Gary Sinise. And it's right at the beginning. It's right at the very beginning. They've just been at the party. They've watched Neil Armstrong land on the moon. Uh, Tom Hanks, who plays Jim Lovell, is sitting out back on a, on a chase lounge, drunk with his wife. Uh, drunk because he's happy. Drunk because we did it. He's going. He knows he's going. And he's lying there on a chase lounge, and he blocks the moon out with his thumb. And I think it's in voiceover. I don't remember exactly what the line is. It's pretty close to this. He says, uh, so, yeah, so we landed on the moon. Uh, there wasn't anything magical about it. We just decided to go. That is the greatest line I have ever heard. It's, it, that's it in a nutshell, right? That's it in a nutshell. Nothing magical about it. We just decided to go. I, I, it's so moving to me. It's, it's so moving to me because it's just that simple. It's just that simple. It's the most impossible thing in the history of the world. It's no, nothing even remotely close to it has ever been attempted, let alone succeeded at. We just decided to do it. Decided to do it. And so we did. And that's what you're ultimately selling when you, when you talk about the free frontier, when you're talking about selling space to the American people. What you're really doing is you're selling them, you're selling the, you're, you're giving them the Cadillac ad, which is a nice way to close the show. Uh, you're giving them the Cadillac ad. And what the Cadillac ad basically said about going to the moon was, America is such an amazing place that the most difficult thing, not only the most difficult thing ever done, but the most difficult thing imaginable was kind of a piece of cake. And, and actually, once we did it, we were so good at it, we got bored. That's an amazing country. And I think ultimately, when you talk about making space sell sellable to Americans, I'm about to do it. People have asked about Free Frontier. We'll talk about it more in the future. Uh, I'm not going to... One thing I learned about... I learned a lot from launching this website. And I learned a lot about the mistakes we made launching this website. I learned a lot about disappointing people with product that was late. And I learned a lot. And I learned it on a genetic level. It hurt a lot. Um, so what I learned about that is that I'm going to launch the Free Frontier when I have this movie ready because I'm going to tie the movie into it. I'm going to have a movie that is a realistic vision of people in space using hardware that's not only not not only possible but has been around for 40 years. And when that movie's over, there's going to be a plaque up there, a little a little title up there that's basically going to say If you want to do this for real, go to freefrontier.org today. You want to do it now? You want to do it? Let's do it. Let's go. So I'm, I'm waiting. That's a couple years out still. i got a couple of movies I have to make before I can make Aurora. I can't do an $8 million movie off the bat. Um, so uh, I could do it if I had 80,000 members, but I don't have that many. Um, so there it is. So it has to wait. But I, you're, you're selling pride and, and space is, is not the selling point. The final thing I'll say on this, and the final thing I'll say on the show tonight is this. When you, are, when you are talking about making the case to the American people for a space program, space is not a destination. Space is not like visit Tahiti because Tahiti is beautiful and space is not. Space has space is space. There's nothing there. There are some beautiful vistas, but there's nothing in space. Space is the definition of nothing. So you're not selling space as a destination. You're not selling space as your friend. I think the way you sell it is you make space the enemy. You basically say, we are going now into the most dangerous frontier that has ever existed. You thought the Wild West was tough because there were bears and Indians and stuff. You stepped outside of your Conestoga wagon. You could breathe and you could eat and you could drink. Can't do any of that stuff out there. We've got to do everything from scratch. This is 100,000 times more difficult than anything that has ever happened before. And the only people in the world that can pull this off is us. That's all. That's it. We are going to, in, in, the, in Aurora, they say this verbatim. They say this verbatim. We are taking this ship to Jupiter, not because Jupiter is an easy place to go. We're taking it to the hardest place to visit that we know of. Going to Jupiter is, it's not only distant. There are further places away, but it is the worst place in the solar system. We're going because it's the worst place. If we can get there and back, we can go anywhere. So we're going to do the hard thing first. We're going to do it not because it's easy, but because it's hard. And uh, and I think that's what you do. You say, you say to the American people, 
the essence of America is a frontier mentality. The essence of America is competence and skill and courage and intelligence and perseverance and guts. That's who we are. That's who some of us still are, because I don't care about the rest of the rabbit people. They're not going to back this anyway. I've, I've, I've spent 40 years watching us cater and pander to them. No, I'm going after the case. Uh, and I'm going to there it is. It's the toughest place there is. It's the hardest thing that we can do. And we're going to do it. And we're going to do it. We're going to make it look easy. And that activates something in people. Not everybody has this. Most people probably don't. But enough of us do. Certainly 10 million of us do. I bet it's many more than that. People like us understand that we live our lives in a sort of a coma and a dream. And that th this business about us using 10% of our brains is actually not true at all. It's nonsense. But in terms of our potential, our human potential, we are idling. This car is idling. And not everybody wants to idle. Some people want to run. Some people want to run fast. Some people want to run. They want to see how fast they can go. And if they're going to fail, they're going to fail at something worth failing at. And they're going to fail in the company of the best people there are. And they're going to learn why they failed, and they're not going to fail next time. Or if they fail again, they're going to fail for a different reason. That appeals to a certain number of people. And that's how I would sell it, and I wouldn't try to get everybody on it. Honestly, uh, Jason, I don't, I don't waste time going after progressives. I don't want to convince them it's not worth it. Uh, they, 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 they have... They have emotional reasons for believing what they believe in, and I don't, have, I don't have time to waste changing their minds. The people whose minds I can change, those are the people I want to reach. So there's plenty of people in this country who would part with $10 a month to get this to happen if it was actually happening, if there was actual progress. And that's what I would sell. I'd sell the pride and progress. Ultimately, that's really it. When I was a kid, progress meant progress. It didn't mean further restrictions on speech. It didn't mean spying on us by the NSA. It didn't mean having the IRS weaponized. Progress didn't mean taking my money and giving it to a government that keeps most of it and then handling out 10% of what it takes to other people in order to buy their votes so they can have more power. That's not progress to me. Progress is not telling people what to think. Progress is not telling people what they can say. And progress is not is not setting your thermostats to 58 degrees in the winter. And, therm and, and, and progress is not a a piece of crap car that gets 60 miles to the gallon because it has two cylinders and progress is not sitting around raising money for the Guatemalan water snake. That's not progress. That's that's regress. Progress is about doing things that haven't been done before, building things that go faster than they've ever gone, higher, better, deeper, whatever. That's progress. That appeals to a certain number of people, and I'm one of them, and you are too. So I think this would be a good time to break it off at two, two hours and 23 minutes. 